officials had formulated the stories about these events that they told. These eyewitnesses did not merely set going a process of oral transmission that soon went its own way without reference to them. They remained throughout their lifetime a source that may have varied for figures of central or more marginal significance. The authoritative guarantors of the stories they continued to tell, Richard Balcom, Jesus and the eyewitnesses, the gospel as eyewitnesses, Grand Rapids, Ehrman, 2006. Uh, in Richard Balcom's book, uh, basically, he's challenging the form critics. The form critics would say, and a lot of skepticism would say, that Jesus developed as a myth by a competing number of storytellers, principally in the plural, there were these communities who we don't know who they were, who wrote these stories about Jesus and that's how things developed. Note in the historical research of Papias, who is mentioned by Eusebius, and Papias mentions that he talks to the daughters of Philip and try to get eyewitness material about Jesus Christ. Balcom also notes in ancient bibliography, uh, ancient historiography, that since Polybius, uh, Polybius, in 200 BC or maybe a bit more, believed that if you're going to be a good historian, you had to look at eyewitness material. So based on these two researches, one, uh, Papius and Eusebius, two. Uh, the research done on how ancient historians work uh, based on Burridge's book and also if you look at the four lectures of um, Dr. Balcom at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary on the Gospels as history you'll get an understanding of this debate. So what you find is because of this research, there's a strong case that the Gospels are based on eyewitness material. You can see this in the Gospel of Mark, and this is quoting uh, Richard Balcom. Mark writes in a similar way to historians of his time. He uses the narrative methods of inclusio, a historical method of his time. Peter is made central in this inclusio, which means is was the eyewitness material being etc. You can go into in depth look at this in Richard Balcom's book. So basically I've provided a simple a couple of simple arguments. Number one, the gospels are in the first century. This is seen by the 19,000 quotes of the early church fathers from the second century. And so cannot be denied. We've seen secondly that based on the research of people like um, Richard Balcom, this material, and that we have to respect the authors as being trustworthy. We also saw that the resurrection in a, a large variety of uh, religious literature, both from the first and second century, have a consistent story of a Jesus dying and rising, which points to a clear historical narrative that could not have been invented nor could have developed over time because there's so much cross-referencing of different historical documents, religious documents.
So it's a broad argument. It's a broad argument that I'm bringing based on Balcom's book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. So here's some of my other thoughts. In Mark chapter 14, verse 66 and 72, we know that the gospel is based on Peter's testimony. Why would Mark put in Peter's denial of Jesus if it did not happen? Also, why would Peter be a coward at the time of Jesus' death? So, Sorry, here's my conclusions of this evidence. We've given the depth of the evidence of the historical variety of the gospel, veracity of the denied witness. Now here's the conclusion of what what that gives us, what that helps us on the table. In Mark chapter 14, 66, 72, as we know that the gospel is based on Peter's testimony, why would Mark put in Peter's denial of Jesus if it did not happen? From Balkan's work, we know, and from early tradition, many of the sources we could go into if we wanted to, we know that the Gospel of Mark was written on the basis of Peter's testimony. So as we know that, why is it, why is Mark put in the denial of Peter? Why put it in if it didn't happen? It would propaganda so it has a strong historical base also why would Peter be a coward at the time of Jesus death and be bold in preaching in Jerusalem if Dr. Price says that the myth of Jesus that he wrote from the dead started right at the beginning why go into Jerusalem and preach because you'd soon be found out to be a liar what changed Peter from being a coward to courageous? The account of Jesus' death has a ring of historical truth about it. In Mark chapter 16, 9, Mary Madeleine, a woman of ill repute, is the first to bear witness of Jesus. Why make a woman who has only half the testimony of a man in Jewish court, why make a woman the first witness of Jesus? In Mark, we learn that Jesus died on a cross in Mark 15, 25, 37. He was buried in the tomb by Joseph of Arimathea in Mark 15, 43. And he was seen in the resurrection by Mary Madeleine. This resurrection is stated a bold resurrection of Jesus. What is interesting, these facts that we affirm are facts that the vast majority of scholars would agree with. They wouldn't disagree with that. They might not agree with the supernatural interpretation, but they would not disagree with the basic facts that Christ died, the tomb was empty, and the church preached a resurrected Christ. So our research and our study confirm are confirmed in what scholars already accept. It falls in line with the work done by E.P. Sanders. So if our historical source material is in the first century, if it's reliable and based on eyewitness accounts, if it fits the historical context and accords with the scholarship of more scholars, I conclude the following. The idea that the disciples were lying